up our guest for today. She's the Features and Opinions Editor at the Texas Signal. Check out all her work at texassignal.com. She's the host of the Tex Mix podcast, available wherever you get your podcast. And that is Jessica Coggins. Jessica, Mike Leon, Nick Saveri, thank you so much for hopping on with us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, you know, before you came on, and I was telling you this off air, you know, we were talking about everything that's going on in the, in the United States uh, from COVID, the mass shootings that have been happening. And just as recently, there was a mass shooting, obviously, in the state of Texas uh, in Austin, where three people were killed and the suspect was recently apprehended. Whenever we get to these mass shootings, uh, and I always feel like Texas, sometimes they've been in the news involved in these sh- shootings, and we always get back to gun control and that national conversation. It feels like it's a cultural discussion, though, in Texas. Does, does the discussion on guns have to change in order to win over more Texans to support gun legislation? Like, where where are Texans on this side of the gun argument? Because obviously it looks like they're on one side. No, that is true. Um, and certainly Texas is a place where you have this large culture of guns And actually, our legislature in our Texas House, they recently passed a bill. It was a permitless carry bill where you would not need a permit in order to carry a gun. Um, It does look like that will probably not happen in the Texas Senate. So I I think that bill might be done with for now. But I mean, that kind of illustrates where we are in Texas. I mean, I I don't know about y'all, but I don't necessarily want to go to a Chipotle and be afraid that someone is going to be next to me armed. Um, but this is this is kind of what we have in Texas. And that, that is not to say that, you know, I, I grew up in a family where I had some family members that liked to hunt. Um, but I mean, they were very careful with their guns. It, they were always locked away. I, I never saw them as a child and they knew how to handle them. So that's a whole different discussion than necessarily just having someone without a permit carrying their gun around a McDonald's or a Chipotle or a movie theater, uh, a lot of places where you don't necessarily think you need to be armed. You know, when we think about Texas, you know, and what we're doing right here is sort of demystifying, you know, what we identify with the state. I think I imagine you run into that often, like when the conversation comes up about Texas. But when we think about you know, recent, the recent election in 2020, and, you know, there's now the, the thinking about, you know, I mean, Trump won like 52%. It's not by much, but there's this feeling that the state's starting to go purple, or at the very least, talking about Texas as a red state is a different conversation than talking about red states that we see in the, in the Southeast, particularly like Alabama, Mississippi, things like that. Am I on to something with that assumption? Is Texas a larger discussion politically than we think of when we think of quote unquote red states? Yeah, I I think you're very correct there. I mean, it's a different state than when I grew up here and I I live in Dallas and, you know, this state or this city has been blue for for quite some time. It's a majority minority city. A lot of our urban areas are like that. Uh, And you're right. uh, So President, uh, former President Trump uh, won the state by less than six points. Um, So it's a closer battleground state than Iowa or Ohio. And it was like that also in 2016. Um, in 2018, Beto O'Rourke ran for Senate and came within about three points. That was the best showing for a Democrat in, in years in Texas. So it, it does, I think, have this tendency to, to be purple. Obviously, in 2020, it did not go the way of, say, Arizona or Georgia. Um, and, and you can sort of see what those states are now doing in, in terms of voter suppression bills, which in Texas is certainly uh, there, too. Um, but yeah, no, I think it is on sort of a national scale, a place where people are, are trying to figure out like, what, what is this? And it, and it is so large that it, it's hard to, to sort of to understand in, in just sort of one political lens. If, I, if you had an opportunity to speak to, you know, now new DNC chairperson, Jamie Harrison, obviously famous from his election, you know, in or losing election, unfortunately, in South Carolina, what advice would you offer the DNC to to reframe Texas and to put it more so in play to potentially to go to go blue in 2024? I think Texas is a place that has just been under resourced um, at the Texas Signal. I, I wrote an article a few weeks ago. Uh, that was looking at the Rio Grande Valley. And there were a lot of stories nationally about the RGV, about how, how Trump you know, did so well. And a lot of these places were focusing in on places like Zapata County, uh, which actually uh, did vote for, for Donald Trump. 
one small problem is that Zapata County actually isn't in the RGV. It's just right, right north of it. Um, so that's sort of from the get-go, sort of people not understanding Texas. And so with Joe Biden, he actually improved upon Hillary Clinton's numbers in the two largest counties in the Rio Grande Valley. However, just the vote share that Donald Trump received did increase. And I think there are conversations to be had about why that happened. I think there were certain things specific to his character. Uh, the fact that he was a businessman, a lot of people associated him with success. I, I think his, his attitude did, did appeal to certain residents there. Um, but sort of, you know, that to that conversation about that underinvestment, even from the Democratic Party, uh, you know, I was talking with folks that, uh, you know, they couldn't get anybody to spend money on local consultants to save their lives. So you will have people sort of parachuting in. Um, you know, they won't even know really about Houston. They'll pronounce it like a, like a New York City, Houston Street. Or, uh, you know, they, they won't kind of know. <laughs> I'm going to have to bomb it here. It's, it shouldn't be Houston anyway. <laughs> Not Superman that, that, that did trip me up when I, when I lived in New York City the first time. And I, I felt like that huge shame of, of being like a, a, a recent, uh, a recent uh, resident there. Um, but no, so I think that this is an area where if you invested in, you know, in the RGV, they're sort of saying, hey, you know, if you want to do well in 2022, you got to have people on the ground here at least August this year. And you sort of see that kind of everywhere where you just have to have people coming in, spending the money, I think, in local areas, having those conversations with folks on the ground. So that would be my advice uh, to, to Jamie Harrison, although I'm sure he's getting that from from a lot of places around the country. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he is. You know, there's a couple of things there that you touched on that I wanted to ask you one uh, in particular, because I, I saw something recently that you posted on Twitter about some of the corporations, especially in Dallas, that are opposing uh, some legislation that may make it harder for people to vote. We saw what Major League Baseball did in Atlanta with shifting the All-Star game over uh, to Denver. So take our audience a little bit through what the legislation is that is before either the Texas Senate or what they're actually talking and, and what uh, what it actually does for voter rights in the state of Texas. And then on the flip side, what corporations are doing to maybe put pressure on some of these uh, political figures? Sure. Uh, so there are sort of two dual bills that are happening in the legislature, one on the House side, one on the Senate side, um, and they are enacting some some pretty draconian policies. Uh, so they would full out eliminate 24 hour voting or drive through voting that was implemented to great effect in Harris County. Harris County is where Houston is located. Um, and, and you think about, you know, last year uh, when we are still in this, there, there was a there's a pandemic. Uh, and so naturally that affected people's ability to get to the polls. And in terms of that 24 hour voting, uh, you know, that happened over a weekend where you could imagine people who are service industry employees, people who work at hospitals, people who have sort of non-traditional hours, that was a huge thing for them to be able to do. Uh, so that is on the table. This would also, the legislation would allow basically any partisan poll watcher to be able to if they suspect someone of, of being suspicious, they, they'd be able to record them at a polling location. Um, so this is kind of a large bill that has, has actually had a lot of corporations denouncing it. American Airlines and Dell were sort of the, the principal ones. And in, in Dallas, there, there was a uh, rally at AT&T headquarters. Um, but yeah, so those two, those bills are, are looking like they, they very well could pass. Um, and there, there has been though, uh, you know, corporations that, that have denounced that. And, uh, you know, to your point, uh, I think Major League Baseball did take a stand with, with what they did in Georgia. And I think you're even starting to see some productions actually moving out of Georgia. Um, now we don't, we don't quite have that, that, uh, that filming, uh, filming landscape that they do there, but, but we'll see. You know, Texas, before you came on, Jessica, one thing Mike and I were talking about was, you know, I mean, I mean, personal experience for me, I've had at least three friends and I currently live in Pennsylvania, but I grew up in New Jersey. Three friends all from New Jersey had moved for a variety of reasons to Texas, mostly for professional reasons. And it seemed like Texas was starting to draw companies from the coasts, you know, mostly for cheaper land, but with those companies coming over is also the political viewpoints of those employees. 
it seems like the voting, what's going on with voting, what seems to be, you know, the response, to, like Governor Abbott's response to COVID, like all this seems to be retrograde to what's happening from a business landscape to Texas is actually blowing up, actually, in from an industry standpoint, in terms of Silicon Valley, things like that. How does that all sort of mix together when we think of the future of where Texas is going, both politically and just vocationally, but would also that conservative ideology of trying to maintain Texas to be essentially, you know, push, positioning itself voting wise to what's worked to keep um, conservatives in power. There has been a, certainly a lot of tension. Um, so I sort of mentioned that the Dallas and the, the large urban areas have, have been blue and been that way for quite some time, but the suburban areas have changed a lot. So up in uh, North Dallas, a lot of companies have come there, Frito-Lay, Toyota. Toyota was a very recent move there. And so that has really sort of transformed those areas. Uh, so for folks that might have heard of like Plano or McKinney, uh, these areas that, you know, when I was a child, not many people lived there, but now they are actually starting to attract those, those businesses and those communities. So that has certainly, I think, changed things. And it is very interesting. I think a lot of Republicans, particularly our governor, they, they always like to make the point about how, oh, you know, Texas, you know, we're so much better than California. And that's why people are, are moving to California or moving from California to here. So when you have something like the winter storm that occurred two months ago, where millions of people lost power, our electrical grid couldn't even handle that. Um, that I think was kind of embarrassing. And maybe has, I think, shifted a little bit of the conversation and how these Republicans in Texas are trying to talk about our state. I'm glad you brought up the winter storm, because when we think about news in Texas, it's one of the most shocking things we've seen is that, you know, freezing temperatures, obviously in the southern state, you don't expect that to happen, but it has. And the response in terms of what the grid and the infrastructure, what it tells us about the state, since that you know, since that storm has passed, what has been, what have you seen on the ground in terms of the reaction to that? And, you know, what, what discussions are there about potentially re rethinking the way the grid and infrastructure are designed in Texas? Right. So I think I speak for a lot of Texans when I didn't even know we were not on this, this grid that we had our own sort of grid. Um, so that was, I think, number one, a shock. And then, you know, as I, I talk with people who are outside of Texas about that storm, they are just absolutely dumbstruck that this, this could happen, you know, in the, in the 21st century. Um, I, I was actually very lucky. I, I did not lose any power. Um, I was the only one, though, out of the Texas Signal staff who, who was like that. Um, so pretty much every coworker I knew lost power at some point. Uh, several were under water boil advisories for days. Um, you know, that's been a big thing for candidates who I think are running either this year or in 2022, looking at what happened in their communities. Um, and, and you had, I think, a lot of Republicans that sort of initially reacted very callously. Um, you know, Greg Abbott was on Fox News the Monday of that storm, I think, blaming Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Green New Deal. Um, I'm a political reporter in Texas, and I can tell you we don't have the Green New Deal here. So that was very, very um, interesting. And then I think sort of infamously, uh, Ted Cruz making his way to, to Cancun was, I think, um, that really, I think, un united a lot of people in this state at their ire towards, towards what happened. No love for Fled Cruz on the show. Yeah, seriously, uh, Ted Cruz. Um, we're going to save that for the Patreon portion of this. Um, <laughs> but I want to I want to ask you something there because you just touched on Governor Abbott and recent polling has shown that Matthew McConaughey, that's we're really right, doing this. Matthew McConaughey really doing this. All right. is leading by 12 percentage points if he were to run for governor of the state of Texas in 2022. First off, is that real? Is Matthew McConaughey going to make a serious run for governor. And then two, what are the politics of Matthew McConaughey? Like why, why do we always have this where we have um, people in the entertainment space that feel like they could run for political office? What, what differentiates, and I know Matthew McConaughey has been very civically engaged recently, but what differentiates Matthew McConaughey from any other um, person that has tried this? You're seeing Jessica just receive, by the way, she's about to give you the business <laughs> or I don't know what's about to happen, but yeah. I'm sitting back. 
She, she, she's got the book yeah, coming no out. Pad. I think she got no. Well, ah, there it is. Oh, yeah. well, the green, green lights. Shout I, out the book. I think when you're trying to find uh, the political leanings of, of Matthew McConaughey, you're not going to get anywhere. And I can tell you, I'm about 50 pages into this, and you're not going to find it here either. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll shout out to my friends at the Texas Book Festival who. Who supplied, supplied yeah. me with this. Well, at least you did the uh, deep dive already. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it is funny. We talk about this a lot at the Texas Signal. So so last year, uh, one of my, my colleagues, uh, he, he was kind of interested in, in thinking about Matthew McConaughey running. And, you know, we were kind of like, all right, William, if you, you want to write this piece. And, you know, slowly but surely, there has been this constant drumbeat of people asking whether or not he is going to run. I... I will say I have been very skeptical about this until the winter storm, actually. And that is when I did start to maybe hear a little change of tone in the way he was talking. Um, so in, in, in this book, he does sort of detail that he has kind of reached all of the milestones he thought he was going to reach. Uh, he, he won an Academy Award. He is married. He has children everything he wanted to achieve, he has achieved. So in his mind, I think he needs to now have something else to achieve. And I think a normal person would sort of say, I don't know, I, I listened to your, your episode about the Explorer. So I was like, you know, maybe you want to go to like Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, but no, I think Matthew McConaughey, who has never shown any political ideology, is maybe looking to become the governor of the second largest state in, the, in, the, in this country. Um, and you're right, there was a Dallas Morning News poll that, that did show he, he had about 45% of the vote for registered voters. Um, as far as I can tell, he has really shown sort of no political viewpoints. Um, in Texas, we actually, uh, we don't have party registration. So as far as anyone can tell, the last time he voted in a primary was 2012. That's about it. We'll see how it turns out for him, because I think it's interesting for sure. And this is somebody who is living in the state of Florida right now. So the world of interesting lives down here. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, tell us about the Texas Signal. You know, you're all working for a, you know, for a media outlet. Um, and in this day and age right now, when we think about media conglomerates, you know, larger organizations. I mean, we spoke about AT&T a moment ago, or you both did. But um, how are you all? How are you all doing? Like, what is, what is the organization looking like? Is it growing in its prominence? Is it, you know, looking at the landscape of other you know, smaller media outlets? Like, how are you all faring right now? Sure. Um, so the Texas uh, Texas Signal is relatively new. It was started in 2019, basically as kind of a counter to the large right wing media atmosphere that exists in Texas. Uh, so we are the largest progressive media company. Uh, it has grown substantially. I, I have been there now a little less than a year. I think I, I have my uh, one year anniversary in May. And uh, it, it has been very fulfilling. Um, I have not actually met most of my coworkers yet. We do everything <laughs> via Zoom like many, many companies do. Uh, but I'm hopeful that in the coming weeks we'll actually be able to sort of properly uh, get together um, but no, it has been very, very um, challenging, but I think it's, it's something that we always knew that it would be a lot to sort of create anything like exists for conservatives in this state. And we're trying to do our part. Uh, so we do have several podcast platforms. We have the website. We try and do a lot on social media as well. And, you know, just basically <laughs> hold, uh, hold accountable a lot of our state leaders. Well, you know, it's a perfect segue because we had Olivia Troy on, another Texas uh, woman who obviously reported to Vice President Pence. She's now the director of the Accountability Project. Uh, check them out at accountability.gop. Free plug for her. But um, she came on the show telling us about, you know, what it meant to be a conservative, right? And Nick likes to say this phrase, so I'm going to use it because I love it. For a moment of literacy for our listeners, watchers out there, what does it mean to be a progressive? That is, I think, a $64,000 question. That's why uh, you'll I asked probably, it. <laughs> You will probably ask like 20 different progressives and they'll have different things. Uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, being in Texas, uh, we have been a state that I think has, has really failed a lot of our community. You know, we lead the, 
the nation and the number of uninsured. One in five Texans lacks health insurance. We have the highest rate of childhood poverty. Our infrastructure is severely lacking. We just had a winter storm uh, where people lost power. People died. I mean, about 200 people throughout the state died. Um, you know, hypothermia, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, these really devastating things that should absolutely not be happening. Uh, you know, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have had some really horrific I think cases and, and sort of communities that have been ravaged by a disease that, you know, with simple preventative measures, it didn't have to be that way. Uh, so for me, I think being a progressive is just asking that this state cares as much about us as we do about our state. Uh, Jessica Coggins, the Texas signal.com. Check out all her work there. Uh, we appreciate you coming on the show today. Also check out text mix podcasts available wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, thank you. All right. That was Texas signal features and opinion editor, Jessica Coggins. Go check out Texas signal.com and that podcast. Like I mentioned, text mix podcast available wherever you get your podcast. So many topics in the state of Texas head over to our Patreon page. We talked to Jessica about, um some of the absurdities of ted cruz uh flying on a plane to cancun what's going on with major league baseball and the texas rangers being at 100 percent capacity while the rest of uh the american baseball teams are operating at 10 to 20 percent fan attended nick there's so much in the state of texas man i you know i i breezed over that mass shooting that happened in Austin, which is terrible um but we talked about gun control and gun reform always seems to rear its head especially with texas um, you know, like I mentioned about the COVID restrictions have been lifted there. Um, the bill that they're looking to pass for voter rights, like what are some topics that, that, that you took or at least uh, your takeaway from the discussion? You know, large state, Texas, large slate of, of opportunities for, for discussion. And, you know, what we did with Jessica today was just go through all of them. You know, for, for listeners of our show, if you are someone who has either recently moved to Texas or you're, you know, visiting out there, or just want to be curious about the Lone Star State, yeah. Jessica just like, does basically like a dummy's guide to Texas politics, which was much <laughs> appreciated by a political dummy like I am. Um, but we go all over the place, you know, and 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 deservedly so. It's a, it's a large state, but it's not, as we talked about, the view of Texas as a quote unquote red state is a very different conversation than when we talk about other states and particularly in the southeast that we quote that we consider quote unquote red and jessica just expands on all of that just takes us through a tour of the state and, and better understanding actually what's going on i mean she referenced many times like at the state legislature level there are things happening bills being passed bills not being passed right. that is not necessarily getting the appropriate level of scrutiny from the national media and i think that's why it's important that's why we do this on the show talk to people on the ground talk to people who actually know what they're talking about yeah, we always try to keep it informative, folks, and bring you somebody that's going to give you not only their take on the topic, but, you know, bring some fact and substance into it. Te Jessica does a great job. TexasSignal.com. Check out all the work that they're doing there. Uh, speaking of stuff, you can check out on a dot com. You head to YouTube.com. Can we please talk podcast? You enter it in. You hit subscribe. You follow us as Nick was smashing the button. Audio platforms, you know them by now. Apple, Spotify, Google, and the rest were available now on Amazon Music. So all you got to say is, Alexa, please play Can We Please Talk podcast. It works. And she'll, and she'll serve that right up for you. IG, TikTok, Twitter, please follow us at Can We Please Talk podcast. Email us at Can We Please Talk podcast at yahoo.com if you want to discuss a fan topic and head over to our Patreon page to subscribe for more bonus content. As always, I'm Mike Leon. And I'm grateful for our Patreon users and everything else we do in this program. I'm Dick Saveri. Take care, everybody. Have a good one.